don't care how late you stay out. Stay out as late as you want. You wanna borrow the new car? You wanna borrow my credit card? Kids today, they really have it rough. I have no idea where we are or where we're going. I mean, when I was their age, life was easy, super easy. Why haven't you gotten a tattoo yet? How come you don't have any piercings yet? Yep, we're lost. We are completely lost. Ooh, sports. It, it, just do whatever the mechanic says to do. Vehicle maintenance is completely overrated. Look, whatever the mechanic is asking, just pay him. Pay him whatever he wants. I wish they had soap operas at night. I like that boy. You should date him. You should date him immediately. Well, what about the creepy guy with the motorcycle? He's cute. Yeah, sure. Spring break in Tahiti sounds fun. Hey, make sure you get all your video games done before you start your homework. You don't have to pass all your classes. What? You have a project due tomorrow and you've known about it for four weeks and you haven't started yet? Sweet! Doesn't anybody want to know if we're there yet? Remember, if you need anything between midnight and 4 a.m., please come wake me up. Hey, I'm on the phone. Could you bring the baby over and let him climb all over me? Hey! Hey, can you please turn that music up? Well, we just stopped for lunch 10 minutes ago, but yeah, let's stop again. I never have trouble with my toddler. I never have trouble with my teenagers. I never have trouble with my adult children. You know, she's right. We are ruining her life. Yes, more homework to correct. All right, whining. Yay, tantrums. Mmm, vomit. We just really need to spoil these kids more. Sorry, buddy. I don't know any good jokes at all. You're 16. You pretty much know everything now. I think 18's a great age to get married. Okay, remember, make sure you turn on all the lights before you leave the house. Hey, could you leave the front door open for a couple hours? Thanks. Whoa, money really does grow on trees.
Well, welcome, Relevant Church, to Sermon on the Lawn. Well, it's a, it's a new thing I'm trying, so hopefully this is going to come out good. I'm trying out some new technology and uh, trying to give you a little different feel uh, since the weather's nice. Uh, wanted to talk to you today. We've been having some crazy stuff going on, and um, I wanted to uh, bring to you a sermon today that I'm calling Snake Oil Salesman. What a snake oil salesman is, if you're familiar with, for example, the Wizard of Oz, the professor that met Dorothy before the tornado, he was a snake oil salesman. So he would drive around in a wagon and he'd have all kinds of elixirs and potions and tonics that you could take that supposedly cured every ill that you could possibly have, except it didn't work. So. Our passage kind of deals tonight with that whole concept of things that don't really work. And uh, a person came to mind that I thought really kind of fit the bill for uh, somebody I would consider a snake oil salesman. Some of us uh, Christians would recognize the name Rob Bell. Rob is an American author, speaker, and former pastor. Bell founded the Mars Hill Bible Church in Granville, Michigan, and pastored it until 2012. Under his leadership, Mars Hill was one of the fastest growing churches in America. He opened up the church in February 1999, and the church originally met in a school gym in Wyoming, Michigan. Within a year, the church was giving a shop, given a shopping mall in Granville, Michigan, and they also purchased the surrounding land. So in July 2000, the doors officially opened to the 3,500-seat facility. As of 2005, an estimated 11,000 people um, attended the two gatherings on Sundays at 9 and 11. And as of March 2011, Sunday attendance hovered between 8,000 and 10,000. His teachings at Mars Hill inspired the popular Love Wins bumper sticker, and the congregation freely distributed those stickers after services. In January 2007, in the issue of the magazine TheChurchReporter.com, Bell was named number 10 in its list of the 50 most influential Christians in America, as chosen by their readers and online visitors. In June 2011, Bell was named as Time Magazine's, actually named by Time Magazine, as one of the 2011 Time 100, which is the magazine's annual list of the 100 most influential people in the world. Now this guy sounds like he's really got it all together. He was cruising along, he was going well. And then Rob released a book called Love Wins, which caused a major controversy in the evangelical community. The controversy was the subject of a Time Magazine cover story and a featured article in the New York Times. In the book, Bell states that it's been clearly communicated to many that this belief in hell as eternal conscious torment is a central truth of the Christian faith and to reject it is in essence to reject Jesus. Now this is misguided and toxic and ultimately subverts the contagious spread of Jesus' message of love, peace, forgiveness and joy that our world desperately needs to hear. Those were all words of Rob Bell. Now in this book, Bell outlines a variety of views of hell, including one called universal reconciliation. Though he does not choose any one view as his own, he states whatever objections a person may have of the universalist view, and there are many, one has to admit that it is fitting, proper, and Christian to long for it. So as we jump into our chapter 4 in 1 John tonight, 
I want you guys to keep this story of Rob Bell in your mind. I think it lines up very well with our passage. And we're starting in verse 1 of 1 John chapter 4. It says this, Dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see if the Spirit they have comes from God. For there are many false prophets in the world. This is how we know if they have the Spirit of God. If a person claiming to be a prophet acknowledges that Jesus Christ came in a real body, that person has the Spirit of God. But if someone claims to be a prophet and does not acknowledge the truth about Jesus, that person is not from God. Such a person has the spirit of the Antichrist, which you heard is coming into the world and indeed is already here. But you belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Those people belong to this world, so they speak from the world's viewpoint, and the world listens to them. But we belong to God, and those who know God listen to us. If they do not belong to God, they do not listen to us. That is how we know if someone has a spirit of truth or the spirit of deception. Now John, once again, is warning the believers that they need to ensure that what they believe is true. In Rob Bell's story, from what I could tell, he seemed to start off with a good foundation. He led this huge non-denominational megachurch. Their statement of faith was wordy, but nothing really weird or outlandish. Even our youth group used to watch this video series he put together called NUMA. But somewhere along the line, Bell started believing something that would lead him to ruin, both spiritually and corporately, with the rest of the body of Christ. Rob started to aspire to a theology of universalism, where all people, regardless of religious background, will be saved by God in the end. He went from one way Jesus is the only way to now claiming that there was no hell because a loving God would never sentence his children to eternal punishment. Bell came to this conclusion most likely because he looked at Jesus' attributes of love, peace, forgiveness, and his message of joy that the world was in desperate need of which are all very valid about Jesus. But Bell didn't match those up with the global message that God is holy and requires holiness, and man can't get there without the saving work of Jesus Christ. God is also a God of wrath, and will call all mankind to judgment when Jesus returns. Now, I have a question. If there's no sin to be paid for, and God's wrath doesn't have to be sated, why did Jesus have to come to earth to die on a cross and raise from the dead? Do you see the problem? I think Romans 1 says the truth about the gospel message, and I think it explains very well what Rob seemed to forget. Romans 1, starting in verse 16, For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Gentile. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. And as the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. But God shows his anger from heaven against all sinful, wicked people who suppress the truth by their wickedness. They know the truth about God because he has made it obvious to them. For ever since the world was created, people have seen the earth and sky. Through everything God made, they can clearly see his invisible qualities as eternal power and divine nature. 
So they have no excuse for not knowing God. And this is what John is speaking about in this passage and also a similar passage in chapter 2, which I talked to you about a few weeks back. And this brings me to my first point. It's easy to lose your way if you take Scripture out of context. When we take Scripture and choose passages that fit our agenda or belief, we are creating a false gospel. Context frames what we read with the understanding of what an author meant by what he wrote. If you jump into the middle of a novel, you more than likely won't understand what's going on because you have no basis for the information you're reading. It is a dangerous practice to not validate Scripture with the rest of Scripture. Galatians 1, 6 through 10 shows Paul warning us again about false prophets and false gospels. I am shocked that you are turning away so soon from God, who called you to himself through the loving mercy of Christ. You are following a different way that pretends to be the good news, but it is not the good news at all. You are being fooled by those who desperately twist the truth concerning Christ. Let's, let God's curse fall on anyone, including us or even an angel from heaven, who preaches a different kind of good news than the one we preached to you. I say again that we have said before, if anyone preaches any other good news than the one you welcomed, let that person be cursed. Paul is not messing around. So how, you're probably asking a question, how can we determine if a teaching is from God or from man? Well, I found this writing from A.W. Tozer, who I really respect as a uh, Christian author and apologist. And uh, he provided this checklist in Moody Monthly uh, in the 12, 1979 issue. It actually gives us seven things that we can look for to make sure that what we are hearing is actually truth. First of all, how does the teaching affect my relationship with God? Is he magnified and glorified, or is he diminished? Secondly, how does the teaching affect my attitude toward the Lord Jesus Christ? Does it magnify him and give him first place? Or does it suddenly shift my focus onto me or some kind of experience going on? Thirdly, how does the teaching affect my attitude towards Scripture? Did the teaching come from and agree with the Word? Does it increase my love for God's Word? Fourthly, how does the teaching affect my self-life? Does it feed my self, my ego, or does it crucify it? Does it feed my pride, or does it turn me towards humility? Fifthly, how does the teaching affect my relationship to other Christians? Does it cause me to withdraw, find fault, and exalt myself in superiority? Or does it lead me to genuine love for all that truly know Christ? Number six, how does the teaching affect my relationship to the world system? Does it lead me to pursue the lust of the flesh, the lust of my eyes, and the boastful pride of my life? Does it lead me to pursue worldly riches, reputation, and pleasures? Or does it crucify the world to me? And number seven, how does the teaching affect my attitude towards sin? I think this is a real killer here. Does it cause me to tolerate sin in my life or to turn from it and grow in holiness? Any teaching that makes holiness more acceptable and sin more intolerable is genuine. It's critical to be discerning with what we call truth. Jesus said in John 18, 37, 
The reason they came to earth and the reason he was born was to testify to the truth. So truth is important. If someone tells you that God told them to live together before marriage, ask that person to point to the scripture that says that. Spoiler alert, you won't find it. That brings me to my second and final point. If God didn't say it, it's not from God. God's Spirit will never direct you to something that God doesn't approve of. In other words, God will never speak to you and direct you to sin. Since sin is anything outside of God's will, it would be ludicrous to think God would direct us to disobey Him. And God has given us His revelation of His will in the Holy Scriptures. We know what God approves of and what He doesn't. If God says that sexual immorality is sin, he would never tell anyone to live with someone that they're dating before they were married to that person. And that also includes sex before marriage. I hope that this will have your mind thinking about what you believe. Now, I'm as susceptible as anybody to doctrinal errors so I'm not exempt from this no one in this world is exempt from this we need to be scholars of scripture we need to make sure that what we believe is contextually accurate if not we can start to wander from truth like Rob Bell did we also need to test every truth we hear against God's Word Remember, if God's word in the aggregate says something is in disagreement with God's word, it is sin and not truth. There are false prophets out there. I would, could rattle off names of people for days who have used scriptural sound bites in their books, videos, television ministries. But I would rather have you start doing this Take every thought of yours captive to Christ and evaluate what you hear before you commit it to be a truth. I'm going to do the same. I have been doing it, and God willing, I'm going to continue to do it. Now, there's one other thing before I close out that I really think is important. John has given us a second warning in this book that Antichrist is already on the scene. We heard it in chapter 2 and now we hear it in chapter 4. Here's something you might not be aware of. Only the church, that's all of the disciples of Jesus Christ, can fight against the spirit of Antichrist. And how we do this is a very interesting thing. Revelation 12:11 says this, and they have defeated him by the blood of the Lamb and by their testimony. And they did not love their lives so much that they were afraid to die. Pastor Darren spoke to us about giving our testimony last week in our church on the lawn gathering. The Bible makes it clear that we defeat him by the shed blood of Christ in our testimony. Now who is the him that John is talking about? In verse 10 of Revelation 12, it is the accuser of our brothers and sisters, the one who accuses the church before our God day and night. The him is Satan, and he is bringing the spirit of Antichrist into the world right now at this time. He is bringing a spirit of lies, deception, and division into our world that is in total chaos right now between pandemics, civil unrest, murder hornets. I mean, 2020 is starting to turn out to be a, a bad sci-fi movie. He is bringing these spirits and only the church can defeat those spirits. So I'm going to ask, take a moment and pray with me to help us not only sniff out false teachers and false teachings and replacing those lies with truth, 
But I also am going to ask the Lord to give us a bold spirit to share our testimony with this chaotic world and speak about Jesus who shed his blood to bring us peace. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we, uh, we take the words in uh, 1 John very seriously today. We are seeing the evidence of the spirit of Antichrist in this world. And we see the chaos that is ensuing because of it. And Lord, I'm asking you to have us do a couple things, Lord, that you would put in our spirit as the church to be in your word, to start to commit it to our memories and our, our hearts so that we can filter out falsehoods. And secondly, Lord, that you would help us to really kind of think about our story, our testimony. What made us want to have Christ in our lives? because that is going to be a powerful tool when it's put in together with the gospel message and also the sacrifice that Jesus made for us on the cross. It's enough to defeat the enemy and that's who we need to be defeating right now. Lord, help us to show love. Help us to not bicker about things, but to point people to, point people to Christ. Thank you for everything, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.